Harold, it's such an honor to be talking with you today. Tell us about why you decided to write The Business of Persuasion. My life has been, in my view, so charmed. Every step along the way was a step toward the final objective. That I wanted to share how I did what I did. My boyhood dream was I wanted to be a newspaper reporter and I wanted to work for the New York Times. You failed in that goal. I failed in that goal, although I think what I did instead has made up for it. My father was a high school graduate and he started teaching me to read when I was three years old. It ended up where I graduated high school at 15, graduated college at 19. Toward the end of 43, I was going to the Army. I went in as an enlisted man, and they put me in an engineer combat group. We were in Normandy about six weeks after the invasion. In early November of 45, I got transferred to American Forces Network. My commanding officer called me in his office and said, we want you to cover the Nuremberg trial. It's amazing. You would go and watch the trials every day and then I report was, at the uh, end of the day. The court started at 10 o'clock, so I would get to the courthouse about nine and, and started doing five or six or seven minute interviews of the, the person who was a guard of prisoners, the man who ran the guards, uh, uh, the interpreters, anything attached to the, you know, running this big enterprise, you know. You were among about 200 with Walter Cronkite, Howard K. Smith. How did you manage to leverage these relationships that you built? Well, you're on to probably what I find the key to the success of my business. And I've always felt that relationships were all important. 1952, you meet a man named Bill Marsteller. Changed your life. I got, I got a telephone call. A man named Bill Marsteller from Chicago got this advertising agency, and he's looking for a PR firm to uh, handle a project for his biggest client, which was Rockwell. We started talking, and we had so much in common. His advertising agency was one of the first to specialize in B2B. Did this term integrated communications exist when Burson and Marsteller no, came no, together? No, I didn't. We, we called it total communications. And from that, uh, it morphed to integrated communications. What was your most personal experience in bringing your advice to a client? It was the racial situation at Ole Miss. Confederate flags were flying on the campus where Dixie was the predominant song that was played by the Ole Miss band. I got this telephone call in uh, early 1997 from the chancellor, and he said, I want to do something about the racial situation. But I agreed to go down and talk to him and do my own survey of the administration student body. And I, went down, spent about three days talking to people. And one of my last conversations was with the football coach. Ole Miss football teams were not winning as much as Ole Miss fans wanted them to win. The coach told me, we'll never have a winning football team unless something's done about this. Went back and talked to the chancellor and told the chancellor, the coach is the only person in the world who can get the flags out of the stadium. All I wanted him to do, call a press conference and make the statement that he made to me. As long as the Confederate flags are in the stadium, you'll never have a winning football team, period. 
On Saturday, which was the next football game, there were a reduction of 75% in the number of flags. The lesson in the story is that if you can have the right leverage, you can accomplish anything.